on the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. So I can do like Hello everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Good show tonight. You see we have a full house. We are talking about restoring voting rights for people with felony convictions. Tennessee uh, bars a higher rate of people with felony convictions from voting than nearly any other state. And, and we want to talk about that. Why is that happening? Um, you know, what, what do you think about that? We have a good group up here to talk about it. Happy to have with us Shauna Huey, Executive Director of Think Tennessee. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. Representative Michael Curcio, Chair of the Judiciary Committee. Representative, thank you for being with us. My pleasure. And Betty Kirkland, Executive Director uh, for Project Return. Thank you for being thank with you. us. So I guess break this issue down. And who wants to take this? What is at <laughs> stake? Um, and and kind of where is, what, when, when we're talking about restoring voting rights, why is this so important? And where do we stand in Tennessee? Why don't I start with you? Sure. Um, and I'm, it's a great, fun question to answer, right? Because uh, we really stand toward the back of the pack right now when it comes to the rate of folks who are prevented from voting due to a past felony conviction, right? So right now we have an extremely complicated system that folks with a felony conviction have to go through to get their rights restored. The system is broken. And if we can find some common sense fixes to that system, then all Tennesseans will benefit. When you say Tennessee uh, is keeps a higher rate of people with felonies from voting than other states, many other states, where how does that how do we stack up? What what do you mean by that? And what are other states doing that we're not doing? And sure. any of you can take that. So I would say <clears throat> the first thing that we're not doing. It's, it's, very, it's a difficult thing to say to somebody, you have paid your debt to society, you've done everything we've asked you to do, um, but now with one hand behind our back and our fingers crossed, we say, go out and be a you know, full-fledged member of society. So, um, so that's, I think, the problem that we're trying to tackle. What makes us unique and what we've learned throughout this process is that um, Tennessee has a very um, heavy emphasis on child support payments, which I think is absolutely warranted, and, and we want to make sure that folks pay those. Uh, but that seems to be uh, a big, you know, payment of fines and fees, including child support, being a factor in getting your voting right restored is something that, that the legislature previously has been very committed to, and I think our citizens have been very committed to. Uh, and so the question is, how do we untie this knot while still making sure that folks are legitimately paying their debt to society, paying their fines and fees? But the question is, does the voting right need to wait Till the end of that line or can it come in somewhere in between but I think because we place such a heavy emphasis on those fines and fees which again appropriate uh, it, it puts us at the back of the pack so I think we have to look at what are the mechanisms that are in place in Tennessee versus what are the mechanisms in place in other states so there's a financial barrier in Tennessee and there's not one in other states or, or there's less of one it, it could be different in each in each case and all right let's say there are people out there who say okay somebody committed a crime when they're convicted of a felony they have given up their right to vote, period. Um, you know, what, what do you say to that? Yeah, so um, we would disagree with that, basically. Um, Project Returns works with hundreds of men and women every year, people who have just gotten out of prison and are coming back to our community, doing everything they can to get a new start and to live right. And so that's the, that's the, the sort of foundation on which all of this is built. And for our part, people uh, who have not committed crimes and are not coming back from prison, we all win when they do well when they come back. It's a win for our community, it's a win for them. And time and again, what we hear from people is voting is important because it's part of being a member of the community, it's part of being whole. And um, I never myself thought about it much until I was in this business and hearing it from people who um, did not have the eligibility to vote. Hearing them say how important it was really actually convinced me. There's some indication that it reduces recidivism, right? There is evidence, yes, absolutely. And uh, I guess what we're talking about also, these are people that have served their time. Is that right? Yes. Correct. Let's, let's, I guess, even further identify what we're talking about. What if you have been convicted of murder or some of the most heinous crimes? 
let's again, I guess, identify when we say convicted felons, they've served their time, then they have a right to restore their, they have a chance to restore their voting rights. What, who are we talking about? So it's important to remember that, that there are certain crimes for which you can never receive your voting rights back, and certainly murder and other similar crimes would be would be on that list. So um, so th th those would be untouched by, by many of the efforts that are going on in the legislature right now. Uh, we're talking about folks who've uh, had, you know, drug possession charges or maybe nonviolent offenses, let's say, uh, who've, who've you know, served their sentence, uh, such as it may be, they've completed their probation, parole, and they're they're on a path to try to get their life back in order. That could be reuniting themselves with their children. It could be reuniting themselves with with their spouse or their family, um, getting a job, uh, learning learning uh, you know basic life skills that that maybe have gone by the wayside while they were incarcerated, and maybe maybe before they were incarcerated they didn't have those basic life skills. Uh, and so uh, this is part of. In, in my view, and this is where, as a lawmaker, I sort of have to balance, um, you know, what we hear from various organizations who certainly are experts on this, uh, with with the needs and, and desires of our constituents. But in my view, uh, main or regaining that right to vote is part and parcel to all of the other things that you regain once you re-enter society. So, uh, it's certainly not on day one that 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 first thing that you're looking for on day one. You're probably more concerned with getting a job, finding a place to live, making sure you've got a, a good pair of work boots so you can get back to work, those types of things. But as we as we continue down that path, we need to make sure that these folks know we're serious about their reentry as serious as they are about their reentry. So what we know is if we don't give them the right opportunities, then they will not succeed. And it's in all of our best interests that they do. Right now, we've got about a 50% recidivism rate across the state, uh, meaning that you know, for every person that comes out, half of them are coming back uh, to be incarcerated. That's not good for those families. That means DCS is raising those children instead of their parents. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a drain on society from a cost perspective. And so voting rights restoration, I think, is part and parcel to a variety of many other things that those folks are regaining when they come back into society. So you take out some of the, the most serious offenses, and, and these are, again, are people who have served their time. You're not talking about restoring rights for people who are in prison currently. No. That's right. Is that Correct. right? Yeah, we want to be clear about that. I mean, right. that's, that's something that I think uh, gets confused a lot of times. People say, oh, you want to, for some, why are we talking about restoring voting rights of folks who are currently incarcerated? That's not it at all. These are people who are helping themselves and have taken that step to re-enter society and made a pledge to themselves, their family, to the state, I'm not going back. And, and they're off probation and they're off parole. Correct. So these are folks who really have, they're along the path to earning back their right to be civically engaged. So how, where does this stand then in Tennessee? How tough a battle is this? Um, maybe there's a bill in the legislature. There I don't know how it's done in past years. Kind of where, where does it stand right now? Yeah, well, I'll make one point, but then I want to turn it over sure. to the chairman, too, since it was his bill. Um, you know, one thing that's different in our state right now is that this really is an issue that whether you're conservative or whether you're progressive or whether you're somewhere in between, this is an idea that has caught hold in our state. So, you know, Vanderbilt does a statewide poll, and they recently asked folks across the state whether they would support sort of this common sense solution, and 74 percent of Tennesseans want to see this process streamlined. So this is something that folks in our state really would like to see, which is why, you know, Think Tennessee and other organizations are so glad to see the progress that the chairman has made. Sure. And it's Republican and Democrat. Absolutely. It's a bipartisan bill. Um, you know, I happen to be a Republican, but there, there are many Republicans, many Democrats who'd signed on to the legislation as it moved through committee. Uh, one of the things we want to be very clear about as well is that this is not a criticism on, you know, our current, you know, system or the Secretary of State or, or anything. I, I think this is a very, very complex issue. And so, you know, asking what the status of the bill is, I think, speaks to uh, a lot of things that we learned as we moved this legislation mm -hmm. through committee. Uh, and so because in meeting with, you know, leaders both, you know, in the administration and Secretary of State, office and so forth, no one comes to the table saying, we're not sure this is a good idea. Everyone agrees, yes, this is the right public policy to help folks re-enter in society. The question is, do we have the mechanisms in place to make it work? So uh, as we moved the bill on the House side through committee, uh, we had a lot of extremely productive meetings with folks who do this day in and day out, do the hard work of actually getting people's rights restored. Because believe it or not, I mean, it's it, it, it's a backlog. It, it takes real humans to do these jobs. I mean, this is uh, it takes a while to, to process this. And so we, what we want to do is see if 
if this legislative fix is necessarily the right vehicle, which, which we believe that it was as we moved it through, but I think also through that conversation, we learned about a lot of administrative things that could be done that maybe didn't even require legislation that could help folks who are seeking out this opportunity find the right person to talk to in state government. I mean, you all gave me some information before the show. I mean, you gave me a, a flow chart that shows kind of... It's something, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> when your rights can be restored. You know, if you were convicted before a certain date, um, after a certain date, again, the crimes come into play. Um, and then you gave a statistic. Tennesseans who have completed their sentence as of 2016, and that was 323,000. Mm -hmm. Number of restorations, number of people, number of those people who are voting is 11,000. That's right, it's 3.6%, Ben. So it's incredible, that's a hugely low percentage. That's, that's right. a very low percentage. And those are of folks who would you know, be, they've completed their sentence, probation, parole, uh, but the process right now is ex it's extremely complicated. And so even if you might be eligible to go through it, we only see 3.6% of folks making it through and getting their voting rights back. And so that tells us you know, there's, there's a way to streamline this for sure. And is that what, yeah, what do you, what do you Absolutely. So we, one of the things that we do at Pledge Return is we provide every individual with what we call a voting rights analysis. Just having the knowledge of whether you will ever be eligible to get your rights back, we think, is, is something that's worthwhile to people. Mm -hmm. um, and so we do that for all of the hundreds that come through each year. Um, for the fortunate few who are actually eligible, who we realize are eligible at that time, we are able to take them through the process. And so I can tell you from a first-hand perspective that it's, um, you know, I would say ridiculous, the, the number of steps and the, the intertwining and the going back and forth, and, um, and it's um, not easy. And so I think that that on its own could be, you know, reduced significantly, improved significantly. Um, but again, uh, I think as the chairman has said, um, you know, reentry is a huge thing for us. Thirteen to 15,000 people will get out of Tennessee penitentiaries this year alone. And when those folks get out, um, many of them are just utterly destitute. Mm -hmm. And so making that transition back to our community work is, is not really optional. It's imperative for us. And I think that we at Project Return, we see that um, it truly is a nonpartisan, transpartisan, um, you know, feeling sentiment, agreement, understanding, and so getting the vote back is, is, is a real important part of that. Is it this complicated by design? I mean, do you think, do you think we're, we're seeing a shift in mindset where there was a time where people believed if you were convicted of a felony, you're done, you can't vote anymore. And now, and, and, and that manifested itself with things that are very, very complicated. Or is it complicated just because there's a lot of bureaucracy and people always intended for you to have your voting rights restored? Or I guess is there a new emphasis on it? I mean, wh why do you think we are where we are? Tennessee really is a place that prides ourselves on running our government like a business. Sure. Right? And so, you know, we, we counted right right now it's about five steps. If Once you make it through the gauntlet of I am eligible to get my rights restored, it's five steps in probably four different government offices. And that just doesn't seem like the way that we're so efficient as right. a government typically. Five steps, four government offices, there's got to be a better way. But do you think it was by design because we didn't want people to vote? We, there was a, an effort to not have people with felonies vote or it just happened that way? I, I think it developed over time. I really do. I mean, I, you know, not to take anything away from anybody who came before us, what I'm proud to see is that there's an emphasis, bipartisan emphasis across the state uh, to make sure that issues like this are thoroughly vetted. I mean, the number one thing that we know we can always agree on, or typically all agree on, in the legislature has something to do with criminal justice reform or reforming the system. Uh, what we know is that we've spent a billion dollars in this state every year incarcerating folks. Uh, we, we incarcerate more now than we ever have uh, at higher rates. and. And if we're serious about tackling that problem, then we've got to be serious about helping folks re-enter so that they don't come back. So how we got here, again, I, I, I tend to think that, that it evolved over time. I, I, don't, I don't think there was any nefarious plot to, to make this overly complicated. But, but regardless of how we got here, what I'm proud to see is that we've got a governor who barnstormed the state talking about criminal justice reform. You've got Republicans and Democrats working together on common sense solutions for criminal justice reform. And in a state where when I go home to my district and speak with my constituents, they understand it. Because part of that is that our system has grown so large, now it's almost like a, a, a disease. You know somebody in your family who's been in, uh, affected by this massive 
correction system, this massive criminal justice system that we that we've created, this complex. And so, if they haven't had a problem, they've got a nephew or a niece or a cousin or a, an aunt or an uncle, and so they can see it firsthand and they realize, yeah, once once you touch the system. It's really hard to get away from it. We've just gone so long with let's get tough on crime mm -hmm. and let's punish those who you know who do wrong and we've got to crack down on this and that and and dehumanize people mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. And and I just wonder if this was part of that or if this just kind of came about because of it wasn't part of that. Well, I also think I mean there's obviously a history in our country of depriving people of the right to vote and that's true. And so, um, but the point is today here now like we're talking about giving people the right to vote and that's what we're that's what we're working on so um, that history is there there have been many ways that it's been enacted um, today we're all recognizing that people should have the right to vote and I do think there's this recognition that this is something that will help all of us yes. right this isn't just for folks who do have a felony conviction I was looking at some numbers from Florida today and their stats because in, in Florida they passed voting rights restoration in 2018 uh, and they estimated that 94 percent of folks with a criminal conviction are living in society right so mm -hmm. this is for the 94 percent this is for sure. society as a whole. We're not just thinking about people who are in prison or people who recently got out of prison. We're thinking about people next to us in our church pews and at our community organizations and in our schools and folks who are paying taxes alongside us. And so to the extent that this reduces recidivism, it keeps our community safer and it really does help all of us, not just folks who maybe historically have been the target of... Yeah, and to that point as well, incarceration affects um, some neighborhoods a lot more than other neighborhoods and sometimes I think about if you have whole swaths of neighborhoods uh, where many of the adults are unable to vote what are their children seeing what is the next generation the younger generation seeing and we know voting is so important and, and it's a, a big issue for us here in Tennessee and so we want that uh, democratic spirit of, of voting and exercising one's voice as a part of society to, to be carried forward but if we have whole neighborhoods where so many adults' um, ability to vote has been suppressed, it's um, difficult. Well, that kind of sets the table. That's, that's great. That sets the table. We're going to take a break. Uh, if you want to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. What, what do you think about this? Take a break. Be back right after this.